Welcome back to another Q&A episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Before we get into today's questions, we do want to make a big announcement that we're very excited about. As many of you know, we have a monthly research review called MASS, where we review the most interesting exercise and nutrition studies from the previous month and tell you how you can use them in your own training or in training your clients. We know that many of our listeners reside in Spanish-speaking countries, and we are very excited to announce that MASS will now be translated to Spanish. Starting on November 1st, we will be translating two issues of MASS per month. Uh, The first will come out at the beginning of the month, and the second will come out in the middle of the month. And if you want to subscribe to the Spanish version of MASS, uh, the pre-sale for that actually begins today. We have a special pre-sale price, which is the lowest the price will ever be, but it is only good for the first 500 people who subscribe. So if you're interested in subscribing, you can go to tiny.cc slash Spanish mass to get all signed up and get locked in at that pre-sale price. Now moving on to other business, we've got an excellent Q&A episode this week. In today's episode, Greg and I answer some listener questions about carbohydrate intake, sodium intake, training to improve your speed or your strength endurance, uh, how to experiment with different training styles and training variables to find out what works best for you, whether or not there is a minimum necessary volume per training session, and much more. To finish off the episode, Greg and I talk a little bit about Bayesian statistics and how to start a fitness career without a formal academic background in exercise or nutrition. As always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy. Welcome back to another Q&A episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your host, Eric Trexler. Today, I'm joined by a special guest co-host named Greg Knuckles. Thanks for having me back on. So we've got a first question for Greg from Jacob Kowalski. The question is, we always hear people talking about power, strength, and hypertrophy, but for some reason, strength endurance doesn't get any love. So what is the best approach for increasing strength endurance that is increasing the maximum reps a person can complete for a given exercise? Yeah, so some of the examples that Jacob gives in this question is... You know, let's say someone wanted to be able to do 200 push-ups or 100 pull-ups in a row, um, or if they wanted to be able to squat 100 kilos for 100 reps straight. Uh, so basically just asking how one would go about training for strength endurance type goals. And so <clears throat> I, I think the answer to that question is going to depend on a few things. First is... Um, like what is the weight that you're trying to to do the strength endurance feat with and how heavy is that relative to your current max so for example if you want to be able to bench press 100 kilos for 20 reps and your current one rep max is 110 kilos um doing endurance oriented training isn't going to get you very far uh just because like you know, you're trying to do a bunch of reps with something that's really close to your max. And so you're probably just too weak. So in a situation like that, getting stronger is probably going to give you the best return on investment. Um, and, and that could apply to a bunch of different things. So it's not just, you know, like a bench press or a squat. So for example, if you want to be able to do 30 or 40 body, body weight pull-ups, um, but your like max weighted pull up, you can only do a pull up with like 20 pounds added to your body. Like again, your body weight, even though it's not like an external resistance is still a relatively large resistance relative to like what you're trying to do a strength endurance feat with. So in a lot of cases, you are going to get some bang for your buck just by, you know, doing conventional strength training and getting stronger. If you have two individuals and, you know, you're trying to do the NFL combine 225 bench press for reps, one of them has a one rep max of 300 pounds and does a lot of like strength endurance type training. The other one benches 500 pounds and does no strength endurance type training. I guarantee the guy who benches 500 pounds is going to do more reps with 225. So, you know, whatever you're doing, it has to be like a reasonable percentage of your maximum force output. If your maximal strength is like probably two to three times more than whatever you're trying to do strength endurance stuff with, then maybe like the actual strength endurance stuff is going to be more of the limiter. But basically, you just want to make sure that your actual strength itself isn't uh, the limiter from the get go. And if it is, you know, 
doing conventional strength training and trying to get stronger will help. Uh, next thing is if you're trying to do some sort of body weight thing, so max push-ups, max pull-ups, max dips, something like that, um, might not be a bad idea to lose weight. And so, you know, that's probably going to depend on how much you weigh and in all likelihood, like your body composition. So if you're 160 pounds and lean, getting down to 150 may not help you if that's going to require losing muscle. But if you want to do, you know, a bunch of pull-ups and you're 220 and 20% body fat, losing weight is going to help you just as much as getting stronger will. Um, so that is obviously a consideration, not necessarily a training consideration, but something that will help you out. Um, and then beyond that, so let's say your strength itself is in a limiter, uh, and let's say, you know, your body weight or body composition is in a limiter. Then in terms of how you actually approach the like strength endurance training itself, I, I think we can probably take some inspiration to how like endurance athletes train for you know kind of traditional endurance not strength endurance so probably some higher intensity stuff so you know uh like a marathon runner is still probably going to run like mile repeats or 400 meter repeats so you know continuing to do some heavy work trying to get stronger making sure that what whatever you're doing is a lower percentage of your one rep max continuing to do that is going to help you um and then probably doing some like quote unquote race distance type training is going to be helpful. So, you know, let's say you want to squat 100 kilos for 100 reps, but currently you can only do 50 kilos for 100 reps. Um, something that, you know, you could very well do is start by doing sets of 40 or 50 kilos for 100 reps and then try to improve on that over time. So you're holding the number of reps constant based on what your goal is, and then tr just trying to add weight over time. And then the other thing you can do is like, quote unquote, race pace type training, where you take the weight that you plan on using uh, and try to add reps to that over time. So again, if you want to squat 100 kilos for 100 reps, just do max reps at 100 kilos for, you know, three or four sets in a session and try to improve on that over time. And so... If you're doing like the quote unquote race distance type training and quote unquote race pace type training, eventually, you know, the the weight you can do for 100 reps should trend up over time and the number of reps you can do with your target weight should also trend up over time and eventually they should meet near your goal. So, um, and then in terms of the kind of conventional training variables, so like how many sets should you do? How long should you rest between sets and whatnot? I think the the NSCA's recommendation is for strength endurance stuff to do, you know, sets of like 15 to 30 with short rest intervals between sets. I don't think that's going to be all that useful, honestly, the, the short rest intervals at least, um, because ultimately like performance is still going to matter here. So I, I think that kind of more normal rest intervals, like two to three minutes plus, would probably be uh, advisable. But, you know, obviously still doing really high rep stuff to improve strength endurance. Um, and then frequency, man, <laughs> I think a lot of it's going to, to depend uh, how how far you are along training to your goal. So if you're someone whose only background is in like conventional heavy lowish volume strength training and you're like you know i want to squat 100 kilos for 100 reps let's uh let's just throw 100 kilos on the bar and do as many reps as i can in this workout and see how it goes and you get like 50 or 60 reps you're gonna be fucked tomorrow uh and you're gonna be fucked the next day yeah I plan some generous rest days following that introduction for sure yeah so t to start with if you've never done this style of training before um Training frequency is probably going to take a pretty big hit on the front end, uh, but then you should probably be able to start ramping that back up over time to more like conventional frequencies of like two to three times per week. Um, and then just as a, a couple, I, I guess, like theoretical considerations is it may not be a bad idea to do like legitimate, like local cardio for whatever muscle you're trying to train. So when, when people think cardio work, they think generally, you know, 
running on a treadmill, cycling, rowing, like full body type stuff, um, which is going to be really good for building like global aerobic adaptations, which will improve global aerobic performance. But if it's something where it's going to be more like targeted muscle groups, so, you know, let's say push-ups or pull-ups, um, you could do cardio for those individual muscles, where it's probably not going to give you huge global adaptations, but there are local adaptations to endurance training. So like improved uh, mitochondrial density and efficiency, more uh, aerobic enzymes, etc. cetera. Um, and so you can get that with like local endurance training, which may not necessarily be globally taxing. So for example, if you wanted to be able to do just a buttload of push-ups, you could just do dumbbell press with like 10 pound dumbbells or like 15 pound dumbbells for sets of like a hundred plus, uh, you know, for, for durations that would look like kind of a normal cardio session. So just take a light weight and do it for like the next 20 or 30 minutes. Um, it's not going to be particularly fun, but that will probably help with some of the actual like molecular adaptations that contribute to strength endurance. Uh, and then if it's something again, so one of the examples given was a 100 kilo squat for hundred reps. If you want to do something like that, like global aerobic endurance is very likely going to be a limiter as well. So just straight up doing cardio is going to help with that. Uh, like, you know, doing cycling or running or whatever probably isn't going to help you all that much if your goal relates to like push-ups or pull-ups. But if it's something like doing a buttload of squats or deadlifts or say, you know, doing an ungodly long farmer's walk or something like that, uh, that could very well be limited by like actual like global aerobic endurance. Um, so just doing straight up cardio could help with goals like that. How stunned would you be if you were in the gym and you saw someone just do like 25 minutes of dumbbell bench. I mean, I wouldn't be stoked for him. I, I mean, that... I'd be shocked. I'd be like, oh my God, what is happening? I mean, am I wrong though? No, no, it, it's it's a good idea. I just, I can't imagine like if you, like you'd be doing a, whatever you're doing, right? And you're mm -hmm. like six sets in, you're like, have they stopped? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's like, I think they've been benching for 13 minutes. Dude, uh, Louis Simmons wrote about that back in the day. Not not really? doing it for like 25 minutes, but um, like, oh man, I don't I don't think he called it the repetition method. Like that was something else. He he had some other like Louisism for it. Um, but yeah, like just telling people like, hey, you want to improve your work capacity for your pressing muscles? Just like grab 25 pound dumbbells and press them for 10 minutes straight or something like that. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think that people lack, uh, I don't know, lack some degree of creativity. So, yeah. you know, n no one's going to bat an eye if they see you rowing for 30 minutes, because that's right. like a thing people do. Um, but like how different, and, and obviously that is going to challenge full body stuff more than like dumbbell benches, but that is also going to help improve like the like local endurance of your biceps, your upper back muscles, et cetera, everything involved in the actual motion of rowing. Like it's the exact same thing doing the same 25 or 30 minutes of dumbbell bench. It's just no one would think to do it because there's not a piece of cardio equipment designed for it. Yeah. The, the arm crank ergometer never caught on at the commercial gym space either. <laughs> uh, that thank is true. God. Those things are horrible. Yeah. They're the worst. Uh, I did have one question for you. So you mentioned the, uh, the 20 the 225 bench reps test mm -hmm. for the nfl combine how do you feel about the general concept of using that in the combine i think it's so trash i do too like a player i really like got got hurt during the testing for mm -hmm. it and i was like great so now you know how many times he can bench 225 like what did you plan to do with that you knew his upper body was strong you don't really particularly care for his position but now he's out for like 12 weeks. Who who was it? I don't recall. I, I thought it was, uh, I think there was an Ohio State lineman that, that had a pretty rough pec strain from mm -hmm. it and, and kind of got sidelined for a while. I mean, the, the person I look at is uh, Christian McCaffrey. He, I can't remember which, either he failed at 225 or 
so he either failed to get a single rep or he got the fewest reps of any running back in the in the draft ever. It was one of those two, but he did he did ab- abhorrently bad. Can't pick him up. Yeah. It's a bad prospect. Uh and and now I mean he looks like probably one of the best five running backs in the league. And you know, upper body strength is probably going to matter more for like a lineman or possibly possibly a linebacker than a running back. But it is still going to matter for a running back. Like that's that's not a position for it's not it's not like a punter, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I think. But I feel like I'd rather see like a three rep max. I'd rather see a three rep max or like even like load velocity profiling. Like that could potentially be useful. So you could yeah. see both. Like, is this guy strong and against like less resistance? Are they super explosive? Um, yeah, I, I would love to see load velocity profiles for like, I don't even care about bench, like for squat though, or deadlift. I think that would be super useful. Yeah. The, the handful of exercises they use, you're, you're just like, man, we've learned so much since we established these, like we could improve them so significantly. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's just inertia at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, m- my favorite though is, uh, the NBA combine also does a bench press reps uh uh test for their combine with 185 right? yeah and yeah. it's with 185 and kevin durant is the only player to ever fail with 185 for a single rep and boy has that hindered his professional career well that's why he never took off in the league yeah i mean it's disgusting you hate to see it all right so moving on um we have d- two questions combined the asker of the first question, uh, we are not saying his name on the air due to profanity, because that's something we clearly care about on this podcast. Uh, but the question is, is fasted training, and in parentheses weightlifting, ever beneficial? The second question here is from Nick. Um, Nick says, I train at 5 a.m. and take a protein shake prior to training. Anything else, or would you recommend anything else uh, to do or eat before working out in a fasted state. Yeah, so I should clarify the uh, the first name was it was just very low humor, very uh, toilet humor name, horrible stuff. I, I would have been more likely to include genuine profanity than that. Um, and what you're going to see with my questions for this episode is they're they're kind of linked. I tried to ar- arrange them in like a step by step way because a lot of people had very similar overlapping questions. So. Let's get started. Is fasted weightlifting ever beneficial? Um, We've talked about this before, so I don't want to reiterate points we've made many times before. You could make an argument uh, in some context that you would want to do potentially some low glycogen training or, you know, do a training about when your glycogen storage is low. But that's going to have a lot more carryover to endurance type exercise in terms of the adaptations we're trying to promote with low glycogen training. And it's important to note that low glycogen training does not mean fasted training necessarily. You could do it in a fasted state. That would be one way to induce low glycogen, but uh, they're not necessarily the same thing because honestly, if you had an enormous carbohydrate meal before bed and then you woke up and, and worked out in a fasted state, your glycogen still probably is not quite depleted. So There are some instances for endurance type athletes of doing some low glycogen training specifically. Um, I fail to see much of a crossover that would justify that type of training strategy for someone who's purely interested in more lifting related training. So if if your goals are strength and hypertrophy, um, the question then becomes, can you get away with fasted training? Not would there be a benefit of, of necessarily intentionally doing it? Um, it's not better to do fasted weightlifting, uh, but there are a lot of people who need to train very early in the morning. And for them, sometimes there's a dilemma where if I try to get a meal in, I either have to wake up way earlier than I want to, or I have to eat in very close proximity to my workout. And then my stomach hurts during my workout. And that actually impairs my performance. So that's kind of the rare circumstance where if the, if the binary decision is I train fasted or I have a whole meal, and the whole meal makes me so sick I can't perform well. In that instance, it might make sense to go fasted, but I think there's a comfortable middle ground that you can achieve. And that leads me to question two of this kind of question pairing. 
you know, I wake up at 5 a.m. Obviously, I'm not going to say, well, why don't you wake up at 3.30, make a nice meal, let it digest, and then 90 minutes later, you can go to the gym. People aren't going to do that. Um, so what can, what can you do to try to get some decent pre-workout nutrition in that scenario? Uh, what else would you have besides a protein shake? So um, on the supplement side of things, there are a couple pre-workout things that might be helpful. Generally speaking, this isn't uh, specific to people training in the fasted state. But, uh, you know, if you can get a, a little caffeine dose in maybe 30 to 60 minutes before, you know, the brunt of your workout, that can give you a little boost. Uh, citrulline malate is usually consumed about 60 minutes pre. So if you just have a little caffeine and citrulline right upon waking, by the time you get to the gym and you're really in the groove, you know, you've, you've probably got, it's probably in your system enough, uh, to, to do something for you. Now, the question was, if I have a protein shake, you know, what else can I do there? Um, before I get into other things, a protein shake is an excellent way to try to get some nutrition in. Uh, that theoretically will be kind of easy to digest. And the reason we would want some kind of a, some kind of protein or amino acids beforehand is so that, you know, immediately after the workout, you've got some amino acids in the bloodstream that can start helping you build some muscle. Now, some people, if they have protein, even if it's a protein shake before training, it can be a little harsh on their stomach and, and it, they struggle to digest it while they're working out. So if that's you, there's a few options uh, on the table. You might find that a hydrolyzed version of protein is a little easier for you th than a whole protein. Uh, they, they basically hydrolyze some of those peptide bonds. It makes it a little bit more digestible. Uh, you could take it a step further and go with an essential amino acid mixture, which I would say is probably the second best option. And then the third best option, which is better than nothing, but probably not ideal, would be would be to go with like a branch chain amino acid mixture. So that's how I would kind of rank your protein options. So now outside of protein, what would you want to do? Um, I do think it's a decent idea as long as you can afford the calories uh, to get some amount of carbohydrate in that pre-training meal. For most people, I say minimum of like 20 to 40-ish grams of carbs, depending on your body size. And then obviously, depending on what exactly you're doing, if you're going for a three hour run, it, it, it's going to be more than that. But if you're going in for a 60 minute bodybuilding workout, you can probably get away with 20 to 40 grams, depending on body size. Um, it is interesting when you look at the pre-exercise uh, carbohydrate literature, there are a couple really interesting things uh, to at least, at least mention. So there's some research showing that even a glucose mouth rinse has improved some aspects of performance. And most of those studies are looking at uh, moderate to higher intensity endurance type training for the most part. And there, there are some mixed results. Some studies show a benefit, some studies show no benefit. But it is an interesting thing that likely, currently the, the, uh, the line of thinking is that there's some kind of central mechanism that you have receptors in the oral cavity that can sense that glucose and they trigger parts of the brain associated with like motivation and reward, and that that uh, has a central effect on on allowing you to perform better in exercise. There there are studies though that fail to show that. Um, I know um, Tromelin. How does he say his his first name? I think it's Yorn. Yorn. So he he actually sent me a copy of his dissertation uh, recently, and I haven't read through the whole thing because it's kind of long. I, I feel like he put a lot of work into it. If I'm being honest. Is really good though. It's really no, good. it's it's exceptional. Yeah, really, really good work. Um, but one of his studies was on a glucose mouth rinse, and, and they found no benefit either in the fasted or the fed state, if I recall correctly. But in any case, it's an interesting thing about pre workout carbohydrate considerations. The other interesting consideration is something called rebound hypoglycemia. And this is something that I believe the initial studies that got big were done in the 70s. And what they found was they gave people. Uh, this pre-workout carbohydrate about 45 to 60 minutes before the onset of exercise. And what happened was, you know, this high carbohydrate meal, they would have blood glucose and insulin initially go up. And then they would initiate this exercise about 45 to 60 minutes later, and they would still have high blood levels of insulin. But then because of all their muscle activity, there'd be an initial drop in glucose in the blood. And what would happen was they would experience hypoglycemic symptoms and actually perform worse 
But we've done a lot, a lot more research on that concept since, and it seems to vary substantially from person to person. Some people are, are a little bit sensitive to this hypoglycemic effect at the onset of exercise. Some people really don't seem to experience it much at all. And generally speaking, the studies looking at pre-workout carb uh, feeding, I, I was going to say supplementation, but it's not necessarily supplementation. But this pre-exercise carb feeding generally either has a positive or a neutral effect on performance across a, a wide range of exercise modalities and tasks. Um, but if you if you do seem to get some hypoglycemic symptoms, if you have a high carb meal in the meal prior to training, there are some strategies that you can use to combat that. And the two strategies that most people talk about, especially um, Asker Eukendrup, I think that's how he says the last name, but I have no idea. Um, but he's like, he, he's a really, really good sport nutrition researcher who, who does more in the endurance realm and does a lot with carbohydrate. Um, his, his two strategies he, he tends to promote the most, it seems, are go with a lower GI carb uh, and potentially even do it in like a mixed meal to kind of make it a smoother, um, gradual rise in blood glucose and the insulin response. Or you can shift that carbohydrate intake closer to the workout, and that seems to do the trick as well. So those are considerations to keep in mind with that pre-workout meal. And finally, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is dietary fat. Um, with dietary fat, a lot of times, because fat digests so slowly, a lot of people, if they have a really high fat meal before their workouts, um, the digestion is just too much for their stomach to handle. Uh, their stomach hurts, they get nauseous during training, they perform really poorly. So if, if we're talking about a meal being consumed within that hour before training, I usually tell people to keep the fat to a minimum. Um, I'm really sensitive to that. One time I had, back in my powerlifting days, I had a huge meal of like, uh, like I went to a restaurant that had like uh, buffalo wings, which are like just remarkably fatty. And then I tried to do like a high rep squat work. I think I was doing small lob at the time. Oh God. I think, I think I had like a million sets of nine that day or something. And I just felt really bad. It, it <laughs> didn't go well. <laughs> so, so don't do that. Uh, some people are, are totally fine with it, but I would say the average, uh, the average stomach tends to be a little sensitive to that uh, immediately prior to the workout. So like I said, you know, there are some some specific instances where a person might say, based on when I have to wake up, based on how my stomach reacts to having any food in there, I'm just going to have to go fasted. And it's it's not at all like, oh, well, sorry, you wasted your workout. You can still do a fine workout with fasted training. Um, I don't think it's the purely optimal way to go about it. But there are certain cases where it beats the alternative of feeling sick your whole workout and performing poorly. But I think generally speaking, there are ways you can accommodate that that pre-exercise uh, opportunity for nutrient intake to get you a slightly better outcome than, than training fasted. No, I, I agree. And one thing that I would add is like, even if you don't have the time or desire to eat something before your workout, I mean, during your workout itself, you could just sip along on Gatorade instead of water. And Absolutely. Like, and yeah. like that, that would still do something for you, especially like if energy levels are potentially an issue. Yeah. Uh, during the workout, you could go with, I mean, any kind of sports beverage is going to be, um, you know, it's typically a five to 8% carbohydrate solution, generally speaking. And yeah, if you want to, you could even put some, uh, some essential amino acids in there, some branch chain amino acids, um, even, some people like to put in hydrolyzed protein during the workout. So, so that, that's definitely another, another good option. Okay. Next question is for Greg. It's from fictional funkness. Could you discuss the relationship between training frequency and recoverable volume? Spreading work across more sessions seems as if it would allow more to be done, but is a minimum volume per session necessary to get sufficient stimulus? Yeah, so th that's a good question, and I think I'm going to address it in reverse. So the first the first question I'm going to address is, is there a minimum volume per session necessary to get in sufficient volume to, to have like a meaningful stimulus? And as far as that goes, like, I don't think we know for sure. 
Um, at least I'm not aware of any convincing evidence that volume in a session can be too low to, you know, ha have some sort of positive beneficial effect. So, I mean, so there was a, um, the, the meta-analysis that most people refer to now as it pertains to training volume and the effects on hypertrophy uh, was by Schoen Schoenfeld and colleagues published, I think last year, I think it was 2018. Um, and, and so it was looking at volume per week, so number of training sets per week. And that's the one most people have top of mind. That's the one that you see most people discussing on social media when the topic of volume comes up. But back in, I believe, 2010, uh, there was another meta-analysis, like the, the prior one on volume that used to be the one that everyone would cite by James Krieger. Um, and I think that may have actually been his first publication ever. Uh, he did one on strength and one on hypertrophy. And, and that was back at a time in the industry when like the the hit crowd, like the high intensity training, one set to failure is all you need crowd was like really resurgent within the industry. Um, and so what James did is basically go through all of the studies looking at uh, single set versus multi set resistance training and the effects on hypertrophy uh, and strength. So two different meta analyses and uh, for both of them, single set training did have a positive effect, but it wasn't as large as multi set training. So I think for both of those metas, um, he looked at single set training and then he looked at uh, like two to four sets and then he looked at five to six sets and then there wasn't anything above six sets um, th that was included in his meta. But anyway, so in in both of those cases, single set training did seem to have positive effects for both strength and hypertrophy. So I don't think I, I don't think we can say that there's like assuming training is like to failure or close to failure, like just one set is still probably going to do something beneficial. Um, if that's something that concerns you, though, I. Uh, I would say at minimum, if you're doing like three or four working sets, like that's definitely going to do something for you. Um, maybe like the optimal volume for you in a session would be slightly higher than that, but like three or four sets is going to be a very, very safe level of per session volume that is going to do something beneficial for you. Um, so then, then that brings up the question of frequency and whether higher frequencies allow higher weekly training volumes and just how that interacts with everything. So first off, one thing we need to keep in mind is that, um, actually, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so, okay, the basic question of does higher frequency allow you to tolerate higher weekly volumes? I don't think there's any direct research looking at that, but I think like logically the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it, at least to some degree. So, for example, if we compared, you know, working out once per week for a given muscle group to three times per week or something, if you want to do squats, doing five sets of squats three times a week, that's going to be kind of hard, but it's not going to be bad. Doing 15 hard sets of squats in a single workout is going to fucking suck. Um, I would very much not recommend you do that and, you know, you're probably well past the point of diminishing returns for what you can get out of that one workout by the time you get up to 15 sets for a single muscle. So I think it's a little more hazy when you when you start talking about like higher frequencies compared to higher yet frequencies. So, you know, I think if you're training a particular muscle three or four times per week, you're probably going to be able to get in more volume than if you're you know, just training that muscle one to two times per week. But in terms of like high quality volume is like five or six times per week going to let you do that much more than three or four times per week. Eh, who knows? I, I think I think that is a little bit hazier. But yeah, certainly, you know, having higher higher frequencies to a point is going to allow you to do more high quality volume per muscle group. One consideration to keep in mind, though, is there's some evidence suggesting that um, if you do full body workouts, it may lead to like a smaller hypertrophic effect for each of the muscles trained 
than if the workout like just focused on that particular muscle. So that's coming from uh, three studies looking at um, l- looking at the effects of protein supplementation on muscle protein synthesis of the quads. Um, and so two of them just looked at different protein doses, only doing quad training. And then the third and most recent one looked at uh, like a full body workout, but still just looking at muscle protein synthesis in the quads. And the, the volume of training for the quads and the protein dosages were the same in the third study as the first two studies. Um, but the, the total level of muscle protein synthesis was like 30% lower, give or take, um, which led the authors to speculate. And then people discussing the study on social media to speculate that, um, you know, if, if you're training more muscle groups within a given training session, like the the overall protein synthetic response for each muscle group you train may be a little bit lower than if it was a training session just focused on one single muscle group. So like on one hand, will higher frequencies allow you to train with higher weekly volumes? Yes, absolutely. But then two, you know, higher frequencies are going to require you to train more muscle groups in a particular session and do more full body workouts. So maybe like that also requires higher volumes to have the same effect on a per muscle per workout basis, if that makes sense. Um, so, so I think that, um, I think that overall the research does lean in favor of higher higher frequencies allowing for higher volumes and then that higher volume probably uh, improving hypertrophy and strength outcomes to some extent but I don't think the extent to which that occurs would be as much as one would assume just looking at the amount of increase in volume you get so for example if you can say increase your weekly volume 50 percent by increasing your frequency that's not going to lead to 50% more hypertrophy, 50% larger strength gains. It may be better, but it may mean like, you know, 20% more hypertrophy, 20% larger strength gains. Um, So yeah, I don't think that was a a particularly well-organized response, but I think I I got everything out there that I wanted to. I think so. Okay. People can put it back together in whatever order they choose. (laughs) Fair enough. Uh, all right. So next question for Eric, Eric, sugar for performance and composition question mark. Yeah. So like I said, I I tried to find some related questions this week and just kind of build them into like a stepwise thing here. So we're just building on previous answers. So the, the, the first set of questions was about, you know, pre-workout, nutrition talked a little bit about carbohydrate and this this question is specifically about sugar related to performance and body composition and you know there, there's a lot of bad press for sugar uh, if you if you look at the kind of clinical nutrition research sugar often gets demonized a bit but you, you got to remember that the the purpose for a lot of that research is generally assuming we're we're talking to the general population so relatively low activity levels and generally speaking I, i i think it's safe to say that the average person is now overweight based on bmi i mean i that's got to be correct right i mean if if the overweight and obesity together is like 70 percent of the population yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's correct. I I can be uh I can be your Jamie real quick and google that as you talk. What what's that reference? Who's Jamie? Isn't she I so I've never listened to an episode of the Joe Rogan podcast. I, but, I haven't either. <laughs> but based based on the memes I've seen, there's someone named Jamie who Joe always tells people or always tells to pull things up for him. I wonder if and I, I always assumed Did that we Jamie just... was a woman, but Jamie's a pretty androgynous name, so I shouldn't make that assumption. It is. I'm also concerned that we just harpooned the entire podcast because I don't think you're allowed to have one if you don't listen to Joe's, right? Like, that's the podcast. Is it, though? I, I thought uh, I thought Tim Ferriss's was the biggest podcast. I don't know. I don't, I've never listened to either. 
I mean, I've listened to like one episode of Tim Ferriss. <laughs> okay, well, within this room, I mean, the ratings speak for themselves. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so anyway, I will Google the average BMI in the U.S. as you talk. Yeah, go ahead and do that. So in, in any case, a lot of the clinical research and the messaging related to it that you see is like assuming that you're relatively sedentary and not particularly fit. Um. And so, yeah, like for the general population that's not actively training frequently, it does make sense to put out kind of the blanket statement like, hey, ease up on the sugar. But when you, when you look at who in the fitness related world or the exercise world is consuming a ton of sugar, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but nobody likes sugar more than an endurance athlete. I mean, all the gels and powders and drinks that they're, they're putting together are like, you look like you're excited over there. Ooh, update. Uh, average BMI is actually worse than I thought it was. Uh oh. Um, What's the damage? So average BMI is tw- in the U.S. is twenty nine point one for men and twenty nine point six for women. Ooh. I I was thinking I was thinking it was like in the twenty seven range. Yeah, I I was thinking the same. Oof. That's almost obese. Yes. Wow. Okay. All so right, carry on. So in any case, yeah, it makes sense that a lot of this public health messaging is telling everybody like, hey, chill with all the sugar, guys. Um, But yeah, like if you're a a relatively lean, very active person, we've got all sorts of of, uh, examples of these like lean, fit, you know, cardiovascularly fit endurance athletes who have a high level activity, you know, fairly optimal body composition. They eat a ton of sugar and they don't seem to see really any negative uh, ramifications for that. So sugar in the diet, whether you're talking health or body composition, it's, it's generally fine as long as you're not like super sedentary. Um, as long as you, you have an appropriate overall caloric intake. And I would say there is evidence that if you go really, really hard with the fructose intake, that could potentially be deleterious, even at a relatively, relatively healthy body composition status. So If you wanted to, if for some reason you had a vendetta against your liver and you really want, we're just out to destroy (laughs) it, the way you would put that together is you go on a very high fat diet with very, very, very high fructose intakes, and you'd probably model your drinking habits after like Hunter S. Thompson. God, what a legend. What a legend. But you, you, you try to make sure you're getting plenty of fructose, plenty of fat, and plenty of alcohol. But like... You know, a lot of times you get this question and it's a person who has a very healthy body fat level, very active, training multiple times a week. And, you know, they're, they're talking about, uh, is 20 grams of sugar here that are going to hurt me? The answer is no. For your body composition, it's going to be essentially equivalent to any other carbohydrate source you've got aside from, you know, fiber, basically. Um, from a health perspective, yeah, you, you don't want to go way overboard and end up in a spot where your fructose intake is like a hundred grams a day, which is pretty high. And even if you were there, the fructose issue, we're talking about essentially burdening the liver with this excess of fructose. I mean, if you're matching your activity level and really getting after it training, especially endurance type training, and even with that high fructose intake, you're, you're fairly weight stable at a reasonably low body fat level, you're probably still going to be like pretty fine, I would, I would expect. So generally speaking, yeah, like it makes sense to say, hey, chill with all the sugar. It, it, it's, it's not like doing you any favors for the most part. But there, there's no reason for someone who's healthy and fit and active to be demonizing sugar. You know, it, it's not something that deserves a great deal of stress or attention. Um, we've already talked a little bit about where... Uh, you know, how sugars might fit into the pre-workout discussion. Um, Sugars, uh, whenever you're talking about intra-workout carbohydrate, you know, most of the sports beverages out there, like I said, are going to be five to 8% carbohydrate solutions. Interesting thing is they often have a ratio of glucose slash maltodextrin to fructose. And it's usually a ratio of like two to one or three to one. And the reason for that is because glucose and maltodextrin use different transporters in the gut than fructose does. Um, so if you were if you were like doing intra workout carbohydrate feeding to try to really maximize carbohydrate uptake, that's why you would utilize um, 
a split in that two to one or three to one proportion. Now for every, I can say for everyone in this room, that's not important. Like when we're training, we're not worried about like, how am I absolutely maximizing gut glucose <laughs> uptake or gut carbohydrate uptake per unit of time? Yeah. That's if you're like, you know, 20 miles deep in a marathon and you're about to bonk. Oh, and, and also uh shout out to Yorn again. I, I think it was his research that found that the like adding some some fruit some fructose into the mix did improve total uh carbohydrate uptake versus just glucose that's very believable his lab does some really cool stuff i mean i know maybe that had been observed before but i know that his so i know he's published research on it and it's his name that i see attached to that the most frequently i'm I'm pretty sure i learned about it as an undergrad so i I think it's been out there, but but I, I'm sure they've added a great deal to that picture. Mm-hmm. I would imagine their, their lab does a lot of really good sport nutrition stuff. Um, now another place where sugar comes into play, you know, it, it is a rapidly digestible carb that would make sense for pre workout uh, applications. Certainly for intra workout, post workout, sometimes people get really into sugar because they're like, I need to get all that glucose in right now. Um, to to replenish glycogen usually glycogen replenishment is not going to be a huge deal for for the typical lifter um or glycogen replenishment did i say depletion i meant replenishment but so what we see is that glycogen replenishment yes there is a brief window in the i don't know 30 60 90 minutes after a workout probably where you still you still have a lot of glute for translocation so when when a muscle and this happens uh, in a localized manner. So whatever muscles were contracting during the workout, it's not just like every muscle in your body. But after muscles are contracting during a workout, the glute four um, transporters, they translocate um, closer to the surface of the muscle. They help let uh, carbohydrate into the muscle to help facilitate glycogen replenishment. Yes, there is a brief window where that translocation is amplified after a workout. Um but, you know, the, the, the times where we really need to utilize that and swoop in and uh, really prioritize a rapid influx of, of carbohydrate after a workout, it's usually if you're doing multiple glycogen depleting bouts within a 24 hour period. What we find is that if you're not on a super carb restricted diet, the carbs you're eating, not just after the workout, but the meal after that, the meal after that, the meal after that, generally speaking, you're going to have pretty sufficient glycogen replenishment in the 24 hours after your exercise bout when it comes to the localized uh, muscle replenishment. Um, And the same goes for the liver. You're going to replenish that over the next 24 hours. But if you are a person who's in one of those circumstances where you have multiple strenuous bouts within a 24-hour period, and there are plenty of applications for that, um, then absolutely it would make sense to prioritize carbohydrate intake immediately after those intermittent bouts. And certainly sugar is going to be a rapid way to to facilitate that uptake. So, um, you know, the carbohydrate sport nutrition relationship when it comes to pre, intra and post workout nutrition, there are a lot of circumstances to consider. Um, you know, it, it really is very contextual, but I think it's it's certainly overstated when you're, you know, a, a healthy, fit, active person. When you, when you see all the public health messaging about getting your sugar as low as it can possibly be. I, I think contextually it makes a lot less sense when, when you're in that position of being really active, really fit, and looking at it from a sport nutrition perspective. I think that's about all I have to say. Oh, the other thing I want to say about sugar. Um, if you're on relatively low calories or a low-carbohydrate diet, something that you would theoretically look out for is if all your carbs are coming from like gummy worms, it is possible that you're eating too much sugary foods, not because the sugar itself is too high, but because you're displacing other good carbohydrate sources in the diet. So you could be limiting your ability to take in sufficient fiber, uh, a variety of micronutrients that we find in different uh, carbohydrate containing fruits and vegetables and grain products. So there are extreme circumstances where you might find someone who it's like, listen, man, you shouldn't have 40% of your carbs coming from Skittles. Put the Skittles down, eat something that is a non-candy carbohydrate <laughs> source. 
So you, you do find that, but not often. Yeah. Not often. Okay, this is a quick question. Short, simple, to the point. Greg, best ways to improve speed with weights, etc. question mark. Hell yeah. Uh, all right, so the answer to this question, uh, much like the strength endurance question, depends to some degree on what you mean by weights. So are you talking about speed with a fixed load? So just, you know, straight up, how fast can you lift 100 kilos? Or is it like a given sub-maximal percentage of your one rep max? So how fast can you move 60% one RM? Um, If it's the first one, if it's how fast you can move like a fixed load, then there are two things you would want to do. One is get stronger. Uh, because then whatever the absolute load is, it becomes a lower percentage of your one rep max. Uh, you will be able to accelerate it to a greater degree, reach higher velocities. It's good stuff. And then the other thing you would want to do is tra- train like the other end of the force velocity relationship and do very high velocity over speed type stuff. So maybe that would be like weighted jump squats or if it's a bench press, like medicine ball throws. Um, so d- just something that's considerably lighter that you can move way, way faster than whatever the target resistance is that you are trying to lift. So that's going to pull up on one side of the force velocity curve. It's going to pull like up and out on the other side of the force velocity curve. And so then at any absolute load you should then be able to move it at a faster velocity including whatever the absolute load is that you are interested in um if it's the second so you know you want to improve the speed at which you can move you know 70 percent of one rm independent of what your one rm is then it's just the second part of that answer so you have your force velocity curve you want to pull out on the low load high velocity end that's going to increase the velocity at which you can move any given submaximal like percentage of one RM. Um, so again, just lighter training, super explosive stuff. Uh, w- what would often be considered like overspeed type training, um, using a motor pattern that is the same as or very similar to the motor pattern you're trying to improve velocity with. And that's it. Short and sweet. Very nice. All right. So uh, next question, or actually two questions for Eric. One is from Alex D, which is, does the split of carbs and fat in a day really matter for hypertrophy or fat loss? As long as you hit your calorie goal, get enough protein and eat carbs before a workout. And the second question from you have here someone else uh, is... It's true. (laughs) Did you just not get their name? Or was was this was this another profanity situation? No, I think this was before we created our new. Um, oh, okay. Question portal. So it was just like anonymous. I well, I just don't know where the hell it came from. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So the second question from uh, someone else, uh, unknown person, but not Alex D, is what effect does high carb have versus high fat? on hypertrophy, strength, and body composition. I think this might have been from... Someone on Twitter gave us a list of like 20 questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think this might have been from that list that we chopped up. Yeah, yeah. It was like NC81 something something. Yeah, I I remember that. Yeah, I I think that's the case. Okay, so this concludes my long stretch of carbohydrate questions for today. A lot of people had a lot of questions about carbs. Um... So these are essentially the same question, right? So basically, you've got some carbs, you got some fats. What's the deal for someone who's interested in strength, hypertrophy, and body composition? Now, the ratio of carbs to fat in the diet really does not have to be super specific. Um, If you look at the more clinically oriented nutrition literature, you see that whether we're trying to help people lose weight with a low carb diet or a low fat diet, generally speaking, the outcomes appear to be pretty similar. Um, you could make an argument that some people do better with one or the other, whether that's due to preference or whether that's due to insulin sensitivity. But as a broad statement, they are both very viable, uh, 
uh, strategies when, when it comes to losing weight. And it goes the same way in the other direction. You can absolutely have a successful, um, successful stretch of training when you're in a caloric surplus, whether you're getting a lot of your extra calories from fat or carbohydrate. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't have a preference when it comes to how I approach things for myself or for my clients. Um, so first things first, the most important thing is making sure your overall calorie intake is appropriate for your goal, whether that's to, to lose weight, gain weight, gain muscle strength, etc. cetera. Uh, the second thing you got to do is make sure you have adequate protein intake and at least a bare minimum fat intake. Uh, so protein, you're usually going to put it somewhere between like 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram body mass, uh, uh, assuming that we're, you know, in a eucaloric or even, in, you know, if, if we're at energy maintenance or, or in positive energy balance, um, you might go a little higher than that if you're in a negative energy balance. And then when it comes to your minimum fat intake, I would say for most people, you rarely, rarely want to get below 0.6 grams per kilogram. Now, once those minimum needs are met, you've got enough protein and enough fat to get the job done. Where you get the rest of your calories is really, um, there's a lot of uh, freedom and flexibility there, but I generally tend to lean on the, in, in the direction of higher carb and lower fat intakes. Um, now, the reason I do that, uh, and the, the question mentioned, like, as long as I have carbs before a workout, am I good? But I do want to reiterate that, like, carb intake isn't as simple as just like, well, you put it in right before the workout, you use it, and then you're good. You really w do want to look at it as kind of an around-the-clock contribution to topping off liver glycogen and localized muscle glycogen. It's not just the pre-workout meal that matters there. So here's the thing. If, if we leaned toward a lower carb approach and we potentially are in a carb depleted state or a glycogen depleted state, first of all, it feels bad. People don't like to feel bad. Second of all, point number two, uh, there, there are studies showing that if we experimentally induce glycogen depletion and then, then test uh, strength endurance, strength endurance is impaired by having low muscle glycogen status. And that shouldn't be particularly surprising. Uh, one instance of that is a study by Leverett, uh, Leverett and Abernethy, but there, there are quite a few out there showing that generally speaking, if you're interested in performing well uh, in, the, in the gym, you don't want to enter the gym in a glycogen depleted state. Um, there's also some very cool mechanistic research by Ortenblad and colleagues where they've looked over several studies at something we've mentioned on the podcast before, but localized glycogen depletion near the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what that does is reduces calcium output from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which reduces force production. So obviously, if you're in the lifting business, reduced force production is not of interest to you. It's not a good thing. Um, and so what's important about that is that they, they weren't necessarily looking at absolute complete glycogen depletion. What we find is that in the early stages where you start beginning, deplete, beginning to deplete glycogen, uh, some of those localized areas of storage near the sarcoplasmic reticulum seem to be preferentially depleted first, or at least early in the process. So um, generally speaking, being glycogen depleted is unfavorable. So it would make sense that you would lean toward a relatively generous carb intake to make sure that you're minimizing the risk of that. Um, when we look at the research uh, pertaining to people that are cutting, there are some reasons, like losing weight, there are some reasons to, to suggest that carbs are pretty solid. Um, there was a study by Maystu and colleagues in bodybuilders where they found that insulin and IGF-1 correlated with the retention of lean mass. Um, observational, small sample, uh, limited ability to infer causation, but um, generally speaking, we would see insulin and IGF-1 typically correlated with a relatively high carbohydrate intake in the diet. Were those, uh, were those natural bodybuilders? I believe they were. Okay. Never so mind then. W one of the big confounding things that I always bring up with that study is um, the insulin and IGF-1 were also correlated with, uh, I believe, fat mass retention. Mm-hmm. So part of me wonders is maybe it wasn't dietary carbohydrate. Maybe those people didn't get quite as lean. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really seeing is that they maintain more lean mass because they didn't get quite as lean. I got you. So it's possible. But in any case, um, they're, the, they're... the reason I asked if they were natural bodybuilders is I was like, 
well, maybe during their bulk, they did more humalog than the other guys and had some like lasting insulin sensitivity effects from that. But never yeah, mind. I- I'm pretty sure they were natural. Um, there's also a study by, um, I think it was Andrew Chapel and, and colleagues where I don't know if he pronounces his name that way. I've emailed him several times, but it doesn't help you pronounce things any better. <laughs> um, but, but they did find, uh, that having a higher off season carb intake correlated with better outcomes again, statistically the, the, the tool, the toolkits limited in mm-hmm. that type of design. But generally speaking, it looks to be like having a higher carb intake is probably going to have a neutral to positive effect in those circumstances. Um, we also know w- with a variety of experimental outcomes that leptin uh, is quite responsive to carbohydrate intake, which is one of the reasons when during a cut, when we're worried about trying to do, what little we can to try to support reasonably decent leptin levels. Uh, I do like to try to sneak as much carbohydrate into the diet as I can get away with. Now when bulking carbs are also pretty solid. Um, Oh, I should also mention that leptin is quite responsive to carbohydrate intake. Um, Well, I I don't want to skip ahead. So like I said, carbs are pretty good when bulking. Um, We, we tend to find that de novo lipogenesis is pretty uncommon. Um, in practice. So de novo lipogenesis is basically taking in a bunch of carbs. You always hear people say, oh, you eat a bunch of carbs, you're going to turn them into fat. That doesn't really happen that much in human beings. What, what's more likely is you eat a bunch of carbs. You'll probably burn a lot more carbs at rest and during exercise. Um, and you'll just shift your substrate utilization to a more carb heavy uh, oxidation level. Um, you'll, you'll oxidize a lot more carbohydrate than fat at rest. Usually your your body would prefer to just shift to being more energetically reliant on carbohydrate than to turn it into fat and then store it. Um, so what we see is when, when we give people really high intakes of carbohydrate, uh, we, we do tend to see that total energy expenditure goes up a little bit, especially if you're comparing that to overfeeding them with a similar amount of fat. And so what that translates to in practice this is something I've observed. And I believe you've observed it as well, but when someone is trying to bulk up and have a particularly lean bulk, a lot of times I'll try to keep the fat relatively low and push the carbohydrate as high as I can get. And first of all, people end up being able to consume a higher total calorie intake than they probably thought they could get away with, even just to try to like maintain their, their normal weight. But as you start bumping it up high enough to get them to actually gain weight, I have observed some pretty pretty lean gains when, when pushing people on a high carb, low fat diet. Um, and you've seen that before, right? Yeah. So there's, there's only one study I'm aware of, like a longitudinal study looking at this. Um, and I believe it was only published in Portuguese and I, I don't think it's been published in an English language journal. So, uh, I came across it on the website Subversity. And so I'm, I'm hoping that they, uh, like <laughs> translated it and interpreted it correctly, but I've pulled up the full text and like looked at the graphs and like numbers are the same. So hopefully I can get, they used Arabic numerals. Yeah. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can get what I need out of like the tables and figures. Um, but so essentially in that paper, what they did is they had, uh, two overfeeding groups And both of them would would be what would typically be considered pretty high carb, but one of them had a 4 to 1 carbohydrate to fat ratio, and the other one had a 8 to 1 carbohydrate to fat ratio. And I want to say that total calories were either the same or pretty close, but basically what it worked out to is like one group ate pretty low fat, like 60 to 80 grams per day, give or take, and the other group ate super low fat. So like 20 to 30 grams per day or something like that, like super, super low. Um, And in that study, the eight to one carbohydrate to fat group gained, I believe more weight, but also like a much, much greater proportion of lean mass to fat mass, Um, which like I only know. So I saw that and I I don't have the discipline to keep fat that low that long. Like, I like having fat in my diet. But I knew a few people who were, like, just legitimately crazy and had... I, I don't think they derive any pleasure from food whatsoever. So, like, th- these are folks who, like, 
one of them literally all he ate just because it was convenient for like six months was peanut butter and whole milk like that was literally his entire <laughs> diet um and and the, the other people were like perfectly fine being just as restrictive with their diet just eating for convenience and so they decided to give that a shot and their diet basically looked like protein shakes and breakfast cereal uh with skim milk which like that may not sound that bad but apparently it gets really terrible really quickly i can imagine Um, yeah but yeah so like all four of them did that and stuck to it pretty strictly for like i think 10 or 12 weeks um and you know basically had what you were describing like they gained quite a bit of weight and um they had uh they didn't get like DEXA scans, but in the gym where they trained, they had one of like the four point BIA scales, um, which isn't great, but is pretty good. Uh, and man, they put on, I, I think, an average of like 12 or 15 pounds and only about 3% body fat, which is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not at a point where I'm like, ready to make bold uh, scientific claims based on it so i i because we like to discuss science so much on the podcast I, I think it's important that we label our anecdote as anecdote but you know i have noticed with my clients well it's it's anecdote plus one study that neither of us read the language it was published in <laughs> exactly so, so it, it 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 possibly has some level of scientific support but we can neither confirm nor deny that. Right. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But in any case, you know, like I have seen with some of my clients that are interested in basically recomping, like staying at their current weight, but, you know, maybe a little reduction of fat, maybe a little gain in muscle. We can push calories pretty high without getting body weight to budge. If we go to a, a little bit lower fat, higher carb distribution, kind of, um, and I have I have seen that the bulks tend to be quite su- quite successful w- when we keep fat either low to moderate and try to push the carbs as much as we can. Um, it, again, that's anecdote. But when I look at the science, I also think, you know, what are the pros and cons of either going super high fat or super high carb? And when I look at the the pros of, of shifting toward a general higher reliance on carbohydrate in the diet, I'm seeing, you know. <laughs> I'm seeing a solid boost in strength endurance, potentially. I I see greater reassurance that we're effectively replenishing glycogen, you know, day in and day out. Um, I I see potentially increases in total daily energy expenditure that might allow us to have a little bit more food to play around with. Um, So generally speaking, like I said, you can be very successful, whether you're going high fat or high carb, as long as all the other pieces are in place. Um, I have a slight preference to lean toward a, you know, a higher carb intake and a lower fat intake, but, but I don't want that to be misinterpreted. You can have absolutely fantastic results, whichever route you go. When we talk about these potential benefits of, of going toward a higher carb, lower fat intake, again, it's anecdote. And we're talking about what what I would characterize as pretty, pretty slim differences. You know, it's, it's not like if you go low fat, high carb, it's like, oh, wow, now I can eat. 400 more calories a day. I mean, we're talking about, you know, very, very modest effects when it comes to their magnitude. But when I get people in who really want to push it and want to try to optimize things to that, you know, 100% efficiency level when it comes to their approach, I I do try to kind of nudge them toward higher carb, lower fat. Okay, we got a question for Greg here. The question is from Michael. Uh, The question is, how important is delayed onset muscle soreness? I've been powerlifting for a little over 18 months, and so far I haven't had any significant amount of soreness. Uh, my program has reasonably high volume and intensity. Um, so basically the question is, is that problematic that he hasn't run into any delayed onset muscle soreness? W- would you mind reading the end of that question? Just so A, we can get it on the record, but B, it's your words, not mine. So, Okay. Here we go. Michael, um, he said, kind regards from Germany. 
P.S. The Netherlands must be destroyed. I just want to jump out. It's like when you're a a politician and someone at your rally gets a little bit carried away and you got to grab the mic and say, hey, now let's let's not go overboard. The Netherlands should not be destroyed. Um, They should be beaten into submission and turned into a vassal state. No, no, Greg. (laughs) Just relax. (laughs) You should we should encourage people to say snarky things about the Netherlands. And I, I think that is a sufficient punishment for what they've done. We we can we can agree to disagree. Okay. Would do, would you care to talk about delayed onset muscle soreness? Sure. Right. Um. So yeah, I I think so. De- let me start by saying delayed onset muscle soreness is probably to some degree a proxy for whether or not training was hard enough to be effective, but is also a really bad proxy. So essentially, I think like. If you're training and you're making progress, you're getting bigger, you're getting stronger. I don't care if you're getting sore or not. If So I, this kind of cuts both ways. So some people are like, oh man, I'm still getting super sore from my workouts. Like, is that a bad thing? If you're making progress, like if you're you're objectively gaining muscle and getting stronger, it's not a bad thing that you're still getting sore. And vice versa, if you're building muscle, getting stronger, and you're not sore, it's not a bad thing that you're not getting sore. So, like, getting some degree of sore from training is probably to some degree correlated with the effectiveness of your training, but it it would be a very, very weak correlation. So, I think more like if, if you're training, you're not getting sore, and you're also not making progress... I think that lack of soreness may be a somewhat decent indication that maybe you should be training a little bit harder. Um, But I think like other just like subjective assessments of, you know, I feel good all the time. I'm sleeping well. I'm showing no, no overt signs of overreaching or overtraining and I'm not making progress and I'm not getting sore kind of putting that whole picture together probably gives you like the overall takeaway that, Hey, I'm probably not training hard enough to be making progress. Maybe volume needs to go up. Maybe I need to push a little bit closer to failure. Maybe, maybe I need to choose more challenging exercises with a longer range of motion, which like longer ranges of motion are are generally associated with a little bit more soreness. So like, you know, if, if you have that whole picture not making progress, feeling fresh all the time, and not sore, then yeah, maybe that's indicative of something is going bad insofar as you're not training hard enough. But if everything in the gym is going good and you're making gains, the the fact that you're not sore is great. Like, (laughs) I I don't think people want to necessarily walk around being crazy sore all the time for its own sake. So, I mean... I, I and I've seen it I've seen very different responses from different people so like some folks legitimately like you know get a couple weeks of training under their belt they build up some like repeated bout effect type adaptations to protect them from muscle damage and then they make great progress and they're just never sore from training and that's cool and then other people they do you know, they're not as sore three months into training as they were three days into training, but they do still get pretty sore after most of their workouts, but they still make good progress, and that's also cool. So so I, I do think that there's probably some, like, innate characteristic that determines whether you maintain a, a significant level of ongoing soreness uh, as you continue training, and I do think that does differ quite a bit between people, but... I mean, ultimately, the question is, are you making progress or not? Not, are you getting sore or not? That makes sense. All right. Uh, Next question for Eric is from Dimitri. So, Eric, what are your thoughts on sodium intake for lifters, or whether in absolute terms or relative to potassium intake? Honestly, I feel a little bit bad for sodium. I feel like sodium's had a, a tough go of it in the last uh, 20, 30 years or so. But luckily, there's some newer research that has really helped uh, really helped elucidate exactly what sodium does or, or does not do in the diet. So when you talk about sodium, um, generally speaking, people are worried about, you know, 
a high sodium diet and the relationship it has to things like blood pressure and heart disease. And the relation to heart disease is essentially through its effects on blood pressure. So the, the general concept that, that's been uh, popularized for a long time is you eat a lot of sodium, your blood pressure goes up, you become hypertensive, and that is a problem. Now, what's really cool is that there's been more recent research. Uh, I, I believe one of the prominent researchers in this area is Robin Felder or Fedler at uh, the University of Virginia. And what they've looked at is something called salt sensitivity. And they've looked at, you know, in the population, is it necessarily true that everyone has a blood pressure increase in response to increasing their dietary sodium intake? And what they found is the answer is no, but more surprisingly, the answer is really not even close. Um, If you look at their estimates of of the you know the general population what they find is they estimate that about 25 to 30 percent of the population is what they call salt sensitive and that's kind of the classical understanding you go on a high sodium diet your blood pressure goes up you're hypertensive that's a problem now what they found is that a large percent of the population their their blood pressure really isn't particularly sensitive to any kind of deviation of salt in the diet whether it's going up a little or down a little. And they also found, probably even more surprisingly, that somewhere between probably 5 and 15% of the population is what you could call inverse salt sensitive. So if you do an intervention to reduce their sodium intake in the diet, their blood pressure actually goes up. Oh, that's wild. I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I certainly don't uh, claim to be a sodium expert or a hypertension expert, but there is some very interesting stuff out there when it comes to individual responses. Now, you might wonder why why there's still all these government guidelines that say like, hey, limit your sodium. And that's because if you look at the, the number of people, you know, hypertension is very common. And if you look at the population of people who are hypertensive, a huge percentage of them are going to see a benefit from reducing their sodium intake. So that's why you still see these blanket statements that say, basically, the null hypothesis, all else being equal, is you're probably going to be just fine if you keep your sodium within kind of a lower range. You know, uh, it's a small percentage of the population that's inverse salt sensitive. This is kind of a newer thing. The first I've seen of it was like in 2013. I'm not sure if, if there's a war going on in the sodium research about whether or not this is legit. But generally, it's, it seems that they've made a pretty strong case for it. But, but the reason that you see that, that general recommendation, like I said, the, per, the percentage of people among hypertensives that are salt sensitive is substantially above 30. So it still makes sense to generally tell people, hey, keep your sodium not, you know, like to zero, but keep it within this working range. And, well, and I mean, also like messaging for public health stuff has to be pretty simplistic and straightforward yeah because the the former food pyramid and now like the my plate dietary guidelines are super simple and straightforward and still like no one follows them yeah (laughs) so so if you made it even more complicated and you're like all right so for three months do your sodium levels like this monitor (laughs) blood pressure for another three months put it in this range, monitor blood pressure for another three months, go really high sodium and monitor blood pressure. And then, you know, like plug that all in Excel, do a, do a regression to see like blood pressure and and how that's related to various sodium intakes for yourself. And then from that, you can personalize your sodium intake. People aren't going to fucking do that. Like people in our audience might do that, (laughs) but like 99.8% of the general population you're not going to do that at all. Like you, you, you have to, and I think like public health recommendations and especially public health dietary recommendations catch a lot of flack from like the quote unquote evidence-based fitness industry for yeah. that reason. Like they're coming at it. They're, they're looking at it the same way a physiologist would not like a public health person would. And until you've like <sighs> talked to someone who's a dietitian who works with clinical populations and ask them like what general level of complexity of recommendations do people actually stick with? 
And they'll tell you, like, it's the most basic shit. And if you try to make it complicated, it's not going to stick. They're not going to do it. So, I mean, like, the, the, the type of dietary advice that the government can give the entire population is fundamentally different than the type of dietary advice you can give to serious bodybuilders who are going to, you know, try to dial in everything possible about their nutrition. Like, it's, it's, it's two completely different games. Definitely. Yeah. So when you look at like, what are the recommended intakes for sodium? They generally tell you to keep sodium at or below like 2,300 milligrams a day. And they also tell you to keep potassium in the like 3,500 to 4,700 milligram per day range. Um, Now I, I try to, when it comes to nutrition, I try to make things simple until they need to get complicated, if that makes sense. So I, I, I try to start big picture and then as barriers and challenges arise then i troubleshoot them generally speaking i i think the the most simplistic recommendation would be hey just shoot for the recommended ranges problem solved but realistically uh that most people get way more sodium than that as the question alluded to i think it was in the question there is some degree of uh you know sodium and potassium exist in this balance in the body um, you know, they do have in many cases opposing roles. There are a lot of, uh, physiological processes that involve, um, opposing co-transport of sodium and potassium. So the two are intrinsically linked and, uh, theoretically the kidney should be responsible for sorting a lot of that out and making sure that both sodium and potassium levels are maintained within a, a reasonably appropriate range. So generally speaking, you know, the easiest recommendation, and again, I'm not a dietitian, so this is just my, my perspective of what I've seen in the research and what I've seen just as a human who knows how much sodium and potassium they eat. But generally speaking, it's like, hey, if you can shoot for the recommended, recommended intakes, great. If not, keep an eye on your blood pressure. If your blood pressure becomes a problem, then uh, usually the, the first line of defense that you're going to see is they will tell you to simultaneously, first, they'll try to get an idea of your intakes. But in a lot of cases, they'll say, lower your sodium intake and or increase your potassium intake. Um, and it's it's not atypical to see people with mild hypertension. I'm pretty sure it, it's not atypical to see them give a, a recommendation not only to reduce sodium, but also to increase potassium. Um Obviously, potassium, I, I feel compelled to say this, don't like go nuts and take like a ton of potassium <laughs> supplements because excessive potassium is remarkably dangerous. Um, so it, I, I'm pretty sure that there's got to be some kind of legal limit. If you ever look at potassium supplements, pretty much all of them go up to 99 milligrams exactly. Yeah. I, I think there's got to be some kind of legal limit where they like won't let you do more than that. That wouldn't surprise me. But in any case, yeah. So you, you don't want to... With sodium and potassium, the only way to really regret things is to try to get really cute with it. Like you'll, you'll see bodybuilders who put themselves in a really dangerous spot when before competitions, they, they try to get really fancy with loading this and depleting that with sodium and potassium. I would say try to aim for sensible intakes of both. If you start to run into blood pressure issues... You know, there's usually a multi-pronged approach, which is try to achieve, uh, you know, a a BMI that's more consistent with good cardiometabolic health. Uh, You know, if you're a high level strength athlete, that might not be something you're willing to do. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. There's not a lot of strong men out there that are doing well internationally with a BMI of 22. So I get it. That might be off the table, but, you know, enhancing cardiovascular fitness, reducing sodium increasing potassium those seem to be generally what goes what what goes on when you run into hypertension issues again i'm not a medical doctor i'm not a dietitian so take that with an enormous grain of salt um yeah so i that, that's pretty much <laughs> as far as i'd go with it just make sure it's not a problem and if it's a problem address it the, the oh the other thing i wanted to mention sometimes you'll see bodybuilders uh diets can get low in sodium late in a prep just because you you kind of just stop eating things. <laughs> so like all of a sudden you look at it, you're like, oh, I don't eat any sodium because all the foods that I used to eat with calories were where I got my sodium. And so sometimes the bodybuilders, you see that, that they they really struggle to get a pump late in prep. 
for many reasons, um, but one contributing factor among many could be super low sodium intake. So uh, I, I have known some bodybuilders that late in a prep, they'll actually uh, try to put a little additional sodium in the pre-workout meal to facilitate that. Um, but that's about as interesting as I hope to be with sodium and potassium. Basically, just don't do not do anything crazy. And if you start running into blood pressure issue, issues, do understand that sodium and potassium can both be implicated there. So I, I just want to throw this out there. Uh, I think you answered the explicit question Dimitri asked, but I don't think you actually answered the question that Dimitri had in mind if my assumptions are correct. Okay. So there is a there is a current in like the uh like non-academic bodybuilding nutrition world saying uh like hyperloading sodium can be beneficial for either performance or body comp. It wouldn't shock me if that's what Dimitri had in mind when he asked this question. So do are are you aware of any direct research or or perhaps plausible mechanisms by which like substantially higher than recommended levels of sodium intake could be beneficial? I'm not aware of it, but here's what I would say. If you look at the sodium bicarbonate literature, I can't imagine anybody's loading higher sodium intakes than that. Unless I'm unless I'm incorrect, I yeah. Mean, that those that, are that th- wouldn't surprise me. Those, are, but uh, so the sodium bicarbonate literature um, features some pretty high sodium intakes as part of the sodium bicarbonate, and the bicarbonate literature is positive, but not remarkably so. And any benefit you'd attribute to sodium would have to be on top of the benefit you're attributing to bicarbonate. And I would, I think the mechanistically, it makes a lot more sense to assume that bicarbonate is, is pushing the majority of that benefit. I, th- I think that would no, be I mean, I, fair I, to conclude. I agree. I don't, so I don't think there's anything magical about high sodium intake. I, yeah. I, I just wanted to get your take on that okay, because, because yeah. I, I think that's probably what Dimitri had in mind. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that, but I, I, my initial gut reaction is skepticism, largely based on on what I've mentioned with the sodium. But you, you'd think bicarb probably works, and if sodium was also driving significant effects, you'd probably expect that to be that bicarbonate literature to be markedly more impressive than it is. No, yeah, in for my sure. opinion. A, another, so when I usually see it, it's because bodybuilders when they when they worry about high sodium, it's because they are on like an if it fits your macros type approach to dieting which has no limitation on sodium built into the or baked into the cake so to speak so people often go for these really good tasting things that fit their macros and you do tend to find that there are fairly high sodium intake so if you were to go to any bodybuilder who's in a caloric surplus, who's doing like an if it fits your macros, it's not uncommon to see people that are taking in 7,000, 8,000 milligrams of sodium a day. And usually people, when they finally look into it and find their sodium intake, they go, oh God, <laughs> I, I'm eating three times the amount I should. And usually what you find with them is they have very healthy body composition. They also have plenty of potassium in the diet. You find that their blood pressure is remarkably normal and you're like... It's, it's probably fine. So, yeah. so that, that's the context I typically see it in. But I, I didn't even know that people were were out there uh, drinking salt water to, to get huge. Yeah, it, it was it was a thing on T Nation a few okay. years ago. And I, I could be wrong about this. So if I am, like, don't uh, don't crucify me on Twitter, or Instagram. But I, I think that that's um, I think that that's part of the vertical diet as well. Interesting. I mean, I, I will say, so certainly you electrolytes are critically important. You want to make sure that you're getting adequate intakes of sodium and potassium to keep the old body functioning. Um, but I, I struggle to see a plausible mechanism by which that would be particularly ergogenic. Fair enough. If I'm wrong, someone out there, I'm I'm sure will correct me aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg, we got a question for you here from 
McKechnie Angus. Probably Angus McKechnie? Maybe. I don't know. I Maybe. just copied and pasted it. Well, there you go. How important is it for trainees to experiment with different training styles to see what methods may work best for them? How would you recommend organizing an experimental period of training to see if, for example, you respond better to speed or power training and what should be measured benchmarked against? So that's a good question. Uh, and I think it is critically important. One of the one of the pitfalls that I see a lot of lifters and particularly new lifters falling into is uh, like the internet has flavor of the week workouts, but it's more like flavor of the two or three years type styles of training. So, you know, like back in the day, let's say eight or nine years ago, if you were an intermediate lifter, everyone would say like, ah, do Texas method. And then it became 531. And then for a while, the cube method got super popular. And then it was like 531 again. And now I don't even know. I don't really pay attention to that chatter all that much. But but basically, like there there is kind of like a fitness community hive mind about what the best style of training for lifters of a particular like strength categorization are. Um, and, and, and generally those are, you know, sane and typically effective programs. And so it's, it's not bad that they're being recommended to a lot of people. Um, but the, the pitfall you can fall into is like, something that works well for most people very well may not work well for you. And something that I see a lot is people look at what is written about particular programs on the internet. They take it at face value. They say like, man, if this is the bee's knees, it must be the best thing out there. So I'm going to do it. And then they try it and it doesn't work well for them. And the conclusion they come away with is like, man, I just suck. Uh, I can't make any progress. Something is wrong with me. Because obviously this program is fantastic versus, you know, thinking, oh, maybe this is a good general program, but it's just not great for me. Um, and there is, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but there is some research, not particularly strong research, but some research, um, one study by Beaven et al. and another by Jones and colleagues, uh, basically testing groups of people on, on different training programs and and just seeing like using crossover designs ch checking and seeing like you know do some people just respond to one style of training better than others and it very much seems that they do and so like I, I think that an important step in your training journey is trying to find the style of training that does work best for you and and the stuff that works well for a large number of people probably on average will work for you as well, but it may not necessarily. So, so I think uh, some degree of troubleshooting is important to do. So then the question is like how best to do that. And I think that the, I, I think that there are two approaches you can take and I used to favor the first approach and now I more favor the second approach. So the first approach would basically just be like, to try to find like three or four training programs that represent different broad archetypes of training. So for like submaximal high volume type stuff, you might go Shaco for uh, like lower frequency, generally lower volume type stuff, even though it kind of depends what version you do, you might go like five, three, one, um, whatever. Like there's, there's a lot of popular programs out there whose nuts and bolts are different. So you could just pick like three or four of them, uh, and say like, Hey, these are programs that come highly recommended on paper. They look considerably different. I'm going to try each one out for 12 weeks, see which one I have the best gains from, and then say like, okay, this, this seems to be the style of training I do best with. So I'm going to use this program as kind of like my base training style, you know, just run it until it stops working and then make small iterations on it from there to keep making progress. Uh, that's what I used to recommend. But one, I don't think anyone actually does that. Um, <laughs> because if you're doing, uh, if you're doing four programs for like 12 weeks a piece with the assumption that one of them is going to do best for you, 
then you're kind of going into that essentially year of experimentation with the assumption of I'm going to be doing nine months of suboptimal training. And I don't think people like that. No. Um, and then another thing you can run into is uh, there can be like some path dependency going on. So for example, um, let's say you do a Shaco program in, in like, I don't know for sure, but I think this has happened to me before. So like, let's say you do a Shaco program, you make some gains from it, but not like eye popping otherworldly gains. And then you do maybe like a lower volume, higher intensity program and make really, really awesome gains really quickly. Then can you necessarily conclude that like, oh, that second program is way better for me than Shaco? Or, you know, is it possible that doing that Shaco training, uh, you know, did help you make progress, but also build a really, really awesome base of work capacity that lets you then like benefit more from the like next higher intensity style of training you did. So it's not, um, you're, you're not necessarily isolating all relevant variables when you do a test like that. So the second approach you could use, which is the one that I favor more now, is just hopping on a program and writing it until it stops working and then trying something else <laughs> and writing that till it stops working and then trying something else and writing that until it stops working. And, and by writing it till it stops working, I mean like legitimately give it a good faith effort to make tweaks and troubleshoot and whatnot. And you know, the, the first program or two you try, you may be eking gains out of that for like a solid two years before you plateau. And it's like, okay, this legitimately doesn't seem to be working for me anymore. And then you can just move on to something else. Ultimately, now, I think the, the baseline that makes the most sense, like the, the comparator that you should be the most concerned about, is just how strong was I a month or two ago? And if whatever you're doing now is allowing you to make progress, you can't know for sure that it is the optimal training style for you, but it, it is good enough to make gains, and that is a blessed thing. Because if you're making pretty continuous progress for five years straight, you're going to be pretty big and pretty strong by the end of that process. So as long as you're doing something currently that's letting you make gains, that's awesome. Uh, once something kind of peters out for you, you know, don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, try to make some tweaks within the overall framework of that program to try to make it work for you again. Once it does just stop working, then don't maintain like an emotional connection to it at that point cut bait try something very different maybe that's going to work for you maybe it won't maybe you try something very different and it doesn't do shit for you then you know after eight weeks or so when it's like okay this clearly isn't doing anything cut bait move on to something else so essentially like plateauing hard is your trigger to let's try something very different um so anyway, that's that's how I would recommend doing it these days. And and ultimately, you can't know for sure. Like basically, you can never know for sure that you have hit the optimal style of training for yourself. That is that is an unknowable question. But what you can know is am I making progress or not? And so you use that to guide things. As long as something's allowing you to make progress, you stick with it. Once it stops allowing you to make progress, uh, you know, it's, it's like the quote, the definition of insanity is trying things again and again and expecting a different result. Once it's clear that something has stopped working for you, you know, then try something substantially different. Uh, and if that's working for you, stick with that until it stops. Um, so, so I think that's how I would recommend approach, recommend approaching it these days. And that's a good point you bring up about not wondering if this is the, you know, the most optimal thing you could possibly doing at this possibly be doing at this moment. But just like, if it's really not right for you, you're going to figure that out. It's, yeah. it's not going to take a long time. Yeah. I mean, e even if, uh, even if progress is quite slow. So let's say you're putting five pounds on a lift every two months. Uh, at that point you're putting 30 pounds on that lift in a year, assuming you don't start, you know, incredibly weak. So, you know, let's take the squat, for example. Let's say you start training. 
Um, you know, you do some sort of like linear progression that spits you out with like a 300 pound squat, um, which, you know, seems to be somewhat typical for your first few months of training. And then let's say for the next five years, uh, you know, you're making pretty slow but steady progress and you're putting five pounds on your squat every two months. That's 30 pounds a year. That's 150 pounds in five years. That's a 450 squat. At that point, like you're a fairly strong person. At no point in that process was anything super exciting. Like you weren't, you know, setting the world on fire, but like you look back and it's like, oh, I have a lot to show for these last five years of training. Um, if it's any slower than like five pounds per two months, I would kind of consider that a plateau. Like you're, unless you're already like a super advanced lifter, you're at that point, you're not really making strength gains fast enough that, that I would consider you really going anywhere. But yeah, even, even at like five pounds per two months, that gets you somewhere over time. Um, so yeah, I mean, progress is a beautiful thing. Uh, progress plus time gets you somewhere. I mean, that's, that's ultimately the name of the game for everyone. So I, I I don't think, I don't think you should program hop and get greedy because you're making progress, but it's not quite as fast as you would like, because that progress is going to add up. But at the same time, I don't think you should get too married to a particular style of training that you stick with it for, you know, months and years after it stops producing results for you. I agree. All right. Question for Eric from Laws. Uh, <laughs> this is the point that our audience is probably going to tune out, but whatever. We are, we're brave. We are the fitness podcast going where no one else dares to. And we actually mean it this time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, from Laws, do you think that Bayesian statistics will be used in future studies for analysis? <laughs> okay. I intentionally hid this one at this part. <laughs> of the of the the program here because if you're still around you're a nerd whether you know it or not now you know if you're if you're an hour 45 minutes into this thing you're a nerd so you might like this i'm going to keep this very brief and i know that everyone's going to hate my answer because when you answer a question like this the statistical purists hate you for simplifying and the people that aren't into statistics hate you for talking about abstract things Okay, so everyone's going to hate this. I'm going to make it brief. Let's dive in. They asked if we think Bayesian statistics are going to essentially become more prevalent, but that's compared to what? That's compared to the current stats paradigm that we basically all use in sports science, which is frequentist statistics. Okay, so with frequentist stats, like when you read a study and says, hey, here's this thing we did a, an ANOVA, here's the p-value. What you're doing with that general broad family of statistics is you're trying to find the probability of the data given a hypothesis. So what that means is we're going to assume, like let's say we're looking at creatine and we're doing a t-test where the post-test value is higher than pre. You're starting with the null hypothesis that you are assuming to be true, which is that this creatine does not make you stronger. And then what you're going to do is calculate a p-value. And the p-value represents the probability of obtaining the observed data that you collected or more extreme data given the assumption that we know that creatine doesn't work. That's, what you're, that's the assumption you're starting with. So if your p-value is really low, that means that if we assume this treatment doesn't work, there's a very low chance that we would find an effect this large associated with the treatment, Right. So then you'd say, okay, well, we're going to reject that hypothesis and we're going to say the creatine actually did work. That's basically the simplified approach of what frequentist stats are. But but actually it's more like we're saying it didn't not work. Exactly. Yeah. So Fre frequentist stats are weird. They're very weird. And that's that actually is a great segue into the Bayesian stuff because people who like Bayesian stats are like, the only way to make frequentist stuff sound like it makes sense is to oversimplify to a point of no longer being accurate. But that's generally the framework we currently use. We assume the treatment doesn't work. We find a low p-value and say, well, if the treatment doesn't work, pretty weird that we found you know, such an impressive effect. And then we kind of imply, it looks like the treatment does work. Now, Bayesian stats flip the whole thing on its head. 
So a, a Bayesian approach generally, again, this is very simplified, is looking at the probability of a hypothesis given the data. So another way to frame that is, you know, after you collect the data, the question of a Bayesian approach is which hypothesis is better supported by the data. Um, again, it's simplified, but a common application that we have seen in some exercise science papers already is the Bayes factor. And so if you look at, at, at like the BF10, which is one of the ways you can present a Bayes factor, it's basically the ratio of the predictive performance of two different competing hypotheses. So let's make that tangible. The, the competing hypotheses are the treatment works or the treatment doesn't work. If you get a BF10 of four, then you could say, you know, the interpretation would be that these data are four times more likely to occur under the hypothesis that the treatment did work versus the treatment that it doesn't. Okay, so basically it's inverting the question. Instead of saying, what are the probability of getting the, these data assuming a certain hypothesis? The Bayesian approach is after we collect the data, which hypothesis do we seem to support uh, more? And really, that's the question we're always asking in these studies is, did it work or not work? Which hypothesis did the data uh, most closely support? And so then the question, I think a very fair question would be, why don't we all do Bayesian statistics always? I don't really know the answer to that. And usually when you do your first, like, I, I have no expertise in Bayesian stats. I've actually never used them in a paper because it's it's this kind of thing that's just slowly trickling its way into this area. But my guesses of why it's not more common, I believe it requires some more intensive calculations and computation that what you find in the history of stats, is everybody awake? <laughs> the history of stats is where you lose everybody. <laughs> Very brief statement. A lot of times we discover the theory before we have the ability to compute it. If you look back into like a lot of the innovations happening in the 40s, 50s, 60s in statistics, it's like we understand the theory and we know how you could compute it, but realistically, who has access to that computational power? Yeah. But now that, you know, every phone is like, you know, it, don't they say like your phone has way more computing power than like the first mission to the moon? Oh, the so the th this is an actual fact. Uh, the total amount of computational power in like mission control in Houston for the first trip to the moon was very comparable to that of a Game Boy Color. <laughs> Game Boy Colors were cool. Okay, so so I, I think that might have something to do with it. I also think people are unco uncomfortable with the, uh, the idea. There is an aspect of Bayesian stats. You have to specify a prior distribution. I don't want to get into the details on that. No one wants to hear it. But it does introduce theoretically a level of subjectivity that I think some people are a little bit uncomfortable with. You should be able to justify any decision you make regarding the priors. So I don't think it's like a, an airtight justification to throw out Bayesian stats based on that. I mean, or, or if you're coming from a frequentist background, you can just start with a minimally informative prior and it's essentially like a null. Right. Yeah. So I, I think those are two things that have caused people to drag their feet a little bit in the, you know, the timeline of starting to embrace Bayesian stats. Um, if you read exercise science, you've probably seen something called magnitude-based inferences. I mean, one, one other thing I would add there is like most people who aren't statisticians don't particularly like learning about stats. And so I think a lot of people just kind of go with whatever stats they were taught when they were in grad school. For sure. So like, yeah. I don't think there are any exercise science grad programs teaching Bayesian statistics to like their master students. <laughs> and so, I mean, some people might go get Bayesian stats training when they get to a PhD program, or they may just be super into stats. And like, once they get out and they're doing research on their own, they're like, oh, this seems cool. I'm going to learn more about it. But I, I think there's some level of inertia because it's not, it's not part of the statistical toolkit that people are imparted during their graduate education. And for the most part, like, physiologists are going to be interested in like, you know, techniques to study physiology, not necessarily techniques to do statistics. So it's it's just not a common piece of continuing education that a lot of scientists in our field are going to gravitate towards. Yeah, I actually wanted to take a, a, a course in Bayesian stats in the biostats department 
mm-hmm. at UNC during my PhD. And my stat professor at the time was like, dude, that class is very specifically for people who in about a year are going to have a PhD in biostats. You don't want to put yourself through that. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, that is going to be not user friendly at all. And you're going to hate your life every day you're in there. And I was like, okay, I'll learn it later. Um, really brief thing I want to touch base on. Um, people have probably seen magnitude-based inferences in papers. If you've ever seen a paper where the outcome, instead of a p-value, if they just said, like, this was probably beneficial or possibly trivial or likely harmful or something like that, that's probably coming from a magnitude-based inferences uh, framework. Um, you're probably going to see a lot less of it in the future. Um, God, I hope. Yeah, so some statisticians heard about it and and they wrote uh, at least a couple papers, I think, basically saying magnitude-based inferences, um, the spirit is good, what, what they're trying to get at, but computationally there are some issues. Um, and it is not actually a Bayesian analysis. It's just a frequentist analysis that has assumed some Bayesian-ish interpretations. And so... You know, the statisticians, I think, uh, the, the lead author who's done a lot of this stuff is Kristen Sinani, and she she's made some very convincing arguments that seem to be pretty airtight. I, I, I don't think that, you know, MBI, like I said, the spirit of it is good. Um, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world when we when we look at a field with a lot of underpowered studies. But the question is, what are you doing with the inferences? And if you're holding them on the same level of rigor as like a more formal statistical test, that's a problem. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think it's objectively, it's safe to say that, that that's problematic. But when we're looking at these small studies about what increases a bench press more, um, the idea of using those interpretations of magnitude based inferences to get some clues from your data to spur some, uh, you know, inform how you're training athletes or something and you know we're not talking about biomedical life and death situations here i don't think it's the worst thing in the world um to say like oh okay there might have been a slight little benefit there the question is just how how literally are you interpreting those outcomes and if it's extremely literal and you're giving the procedure more mathematical credit than is due you're probably making a mistake so we've talked about what bayesian statistics are We talked about how they differ from the more common frequentist statistics, uh, some benefits to a Bayesian approach, uh, some barriers that have gotten in the way of Bayesian uh, statistics becoming more popular within our field. But ultimately, the question was, do we expect to see more of them in the future? I would say the answer is yes, I expect, because we've essentially seen almost none to date. So I do expect we'll start to see more of it in the future. Uh, But the question I can't answer is whether or not it will really catch on and become a uh, a rivaling kind of approach to the extent that, you know, a large percentage of papers now opt to use Bayesian stats rather than frequentist approaches. I don't know if the field will get to that point where where it becomes a really prevalent thing. Um, As Greg mentioned, we're going to have to, as a field... Um, start to really embrace it collectively. There's that inertia where because it's not what's currently done, there's a bit of an uphill battle in terms of making it more uh, accepted and common. It's going to take uh, a lot of effort from people within the field to go uh, outside of their comfort zone and, and devote a lot of time and effort into learning it and learning how to how to do it, how to interpret it, and how to apply it. I do think, generally speaking, it would be nice to see more of it, but whether or not that will uh, come to fruition, ultimately, uh, time will tell. That uh, That's all we need to say, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay, good. Last question of the day for whoever is still listening. Um, this is a really good one. So last question, we like to do things that are either like, very nitty gritty research related or kind of relate to the profession, like the industry kind of. So this is one that kind of relates to people who want to get into the industry, I think. Um, As someone who went the standard business route after college and is getting minimal satisfaction from their career, how possible is it to get proper certifications for nutrition and training to make a career out of something I'm more passionate about. So basically from someone who doesn't come from an academic background in the field, 
can you get there and enter the profession using certifications and other educational tools? Yeah, so there's there's two answers to this question. There's um, there's an answer to the explicit question being asked, and then there's an answer to uh, what seems to be the implicit question under the surface. So the explicit question is, how possible is it to get the proper certifications uh, to make a career out of it? And it's incredibly possible to do that. How many um, days you got? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if 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 you have a long weekend and a f- are pretty decent at like reading and focusing on stuff, you can probably do the study required to uh, pass most personal training certification courses. Like the vast majority are online. Um, they're like somewhat pricey, but not incredibly expensive to take. So like sitting for a test is probably going to set you back. I don't know, 300 bucks, give or take, I would guess, which, you know, it's not nothing, but that's probably an amount of money you can put up if you currently have a full-time job. Um, And yeah, I mean, like, you get the study materials, you study for a week or maybe two, or like I said, like a long weekend if you're, if you really want to get after it, and you'll be fine. Um, So yeah, it's, it's incredibly easy to get those certifications. The question then is once you have those certifications, how easy is it to make a career out of it? Um, and that's probably going to be quite a bit more challenging. So a couple things to note. Uh, the last time I looked at the data, and this may be slightly out of date, but it, it's probably somewhat close to accurate, is the average yearly total compensation for personal trainers in the U.S. is somewhere around $17,000 a year. So you're probably not going to be making bank off of it, at least to start with. Um, And also burnout rates are really, really high. Um, I I don't remember those statistics off the top of my head, but I want to say like something like 80% of personal trainers don't make it past three years. Um, So it's... Do you know if that income value, does that include people who they have like a client here or there aside from their normal like steady job Mm, i think that's everyone so it may include those folks but one thing to note as well is like i mean most people who do it full-time aren't aren't rolling in it either yeah yeah um because like if you're doing it full-time for at least a few months your income is probably going to be virtually nil Um, So it's going to depend whether you're working at like a private facility as like a a coach who is maybe paid hourly doing group training versus if you're like at a big box gym and you're like, it's your job to get personal training clients for yourself. Um, So it's going to be a lot easier to make a good living from it if you have good sales skills, Um, like especially like in-person training in big box gyms making a good living from it is like 30% how good you are at training people. Cause that's going to affect retention and like 70% sales skills and people skills. Um, cause the people skills are going to go a lot further as far as retention goes and is going to have a tremendous amount to do with like, can you actually get to a full client load? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's not hard to get the proper letters behind your name to get your foot in the door it's quite a bit harder to actually make a good career out of it. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing to highlight, um, you know, there there are some some personal training related certifications that are pretty rigorous that that like will push you academically. And, and, and you know, I, I don't want people to hear that and assume it applies to all uh, certifications when we say like, oh, you could do it in a weekend you know, the fact that there are some remarkably easy ones out there, I don't want people to think that we're saying like, oh, your certification is, is trash. And, yeah, you know, yeah. No, for sure. Th- there are quite a few that require a great deal of, of effort and, and studying. So no, I, I'm just saying for, yeah. for the vast majority of cases, those are like the specialty certifications, not just like the, you know, baby's first personal trainer cert certifications. Right. Yeah. But in any case, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's uh, the barrier to obtaining some like any type of certification in the in the field that barrier is quite low um 
especially when it gets to some of the kind of lower tier personal training certifications that are out there. Um, but yeah, turning it into a career that that's where there's a lot more, like you said, personal skills, a lot more sweat involved of, of really making it happen. And it, it, it's a competitive space. So for people who are getting into it, um, I, I would suggest that a good way to set yourself apart is, you know, not to say like, well, I got the certification. So, you know, the learning side's done. Now let's, <laughs> <laughs> now let's chat people up and see if we can turn that into sales. You know, the, the more that you can continue your education, the the thing that is so important is reminding yourself that, you know, a key part of making this work is to be really damn good at what you do and put, put the effort in, into continually growing in your skill set so that you're actually bringing results to people. I, I think that goes a really long way. No, I, I agree. W one of the, one of the things that makes this particular case hard of, you know, you already have a full-time job and you're thinking about transitioning into being a trainer is like the, so one of the first things I'd recommend to someone who's like fresh out of school and they're like, I want to be a personal trainer is I would recommend going and trying to get like a mentorship with someone who's already really, really good at what they do, where like, maybe you're not going to be paid at all. Maybe you're just going to be paid peanuts, but essentially you're working in this facility, you're shadowing the person, you're seeing how they do things because like the gap between, you know, what you learn about writing training programs in a personal trainer certification and the actual skills of training people and being good at that and getting results. Like there's a very big gap there. Um, and so like one of the things that's going to help the most is like learning firsthand in person from someone who has years of experience doing at it and is or, or doing that and is legitimately good at their craft. Um, but you know, if, if you currently have a job, you probably, you're probably accustomed to a lifestyle that is better and more expensive than someone who's just graduating college, you know? And so like, most people aren't going to want to massively downgrade their life or go into a tremendous amount of debt to shadow a really good trainer for three or six months to start picking up on some of those like softer skills of training. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, it's one of those things where you can learn on the job in like a self-directed way of like, okay, I'm a trainer now. I need to get clients. I need to, you know, make money to keep a roof over my head but you don't actually have skills training people, you're probably going to be pretty bad at first. And like just, yeah. you know, just monitoring yourself and being your own harshest critic can help you improve pretty quickly, but probably not as quickly as like actually learning from someone firsthand. So it, it makes this particular situation more challenging. Definitely. Well, I think that does it for this Q&A episode. As always, thank you for listening. And if you want one of your questions answered, on a future Q&A episode, if you have some more nitty gritty questions about Bayesian statistics and how to identify your prior distributions, uh, you can send those to, what's the, the URL? Tiny.cc slash SBSQA, SBSQA, all lowercase. SBSQA, perfect, yeah. And you will find that link in the episode description as well. Take care, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.